Um, but I will start with, uh, to kick off the meeting with a question to um, Kai, just to also integrate him in the conversation and hear his voice. But please, please um, uh, enter your questions in the Q&A tool um, of the um, Zoom tool. So, um, Kai, <laughs> we heard from Yvonne, uh, about uh, a lot about the scientific insights uh, of the visual uh, effects and 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 uh, psychological um, effects, and then uh, from Johannes about the design processes. Uh, now we know that uh, with uh, legislation, it's a bit um, more difficult or the time lag between um, the research um, outcomes and then integrating this into standards is sometimes long, especially when there is no. Uh, political urgency or priority. Um, so maybe you could highlight or just uh, talk to us about um, the activities that are um, ongoing in including this health aspect of daylight in the standards or directives. So I know that you know them very well on the German level, but more, maybe also on the international level. And of course, um, later on, Johannes and Ivonia are also invited to to join <laughs> the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Aisha, for this question. Um, in uh, Germany, there are um, multiple efforts uh, going on in integrating um, health aspects and um, yeah, daylight into work directives or um, standardization um, issues like um, DEAN standards, um, like the German industry standards are called. Um, in um, the just published new version of the workplace directive, um, there is um, there are some some uh, changes made um, already included and uh, priority for daylighting at workplaces was already given, but um, now uh, at a very low level of 2% uh, daylight factor, um, mm -hmm. Besides, but um, yeah, we heard a, a little bit about this in the presentations before. Um, but now um, they uh, went a step further and included the um, line of sight to the outdoor world uh, in this workplace directive. And um, I, I heard it was a um, big effort to get this into this um, law-like um, paper. <laughs> So um, the steps are um, yeah tiny, but um, th there they are, and um, I guess it's um, worth keeping on um, doing these efforts um, in um, by two two aspects. Um, for one, there's this health aspect, and on the other side, I guess um, we we can save energy and um, both aspects will save money for employers. So um, it should be uh, something to worry about. And um, um, yeah, on the other side in the um, German Standardization um, Institute, um, there's work going on uh, in the uh, criteria for lighting design and integrating um, biological or health non-visual effects into um, the workplace lighting um, workplace lighting um, yeah uh, it's guidelines and not um, on a um, law level like the workplace directive because there are some stakeholders which don't want to have these uh, written down in standards um, but um, yeah, there's a lot of effort going on. Um, and in this uh, technical spe specification um, of the um, German Institute for Standardization, um, uh, there are some guidelines in integrating um, these health aspects into lighting, lighting design. Um, and there's currently work going on in um, translating in, into uh, an English version um, to start or um, yeah put more uh, effort in the international discussion and uh, to have maybe a back loop into the um, workplace directive in, in Germany, <laughs> I guess. 
So it's a, a slow process, um, but work is going on. Thank you. Um, maybe building on that, um, as we know, there are well, two effective ways to change things. One is through legislation, the other one is through education, maybe long term. And there's also a question from Rebecca. Um, she says that as a lighting designer, she can uh, verify the frustration with not being involved, involved in early um, or early enough um, on to the impact uh, light lighting to impact the lighting decision. Sorry, and what possible explanation um, can explain why architecture schools are not or have not embraced a focus on daylight harvesting with building orientations and floor plans. Um, so also, um, I think two questions. Oh, oh, the first one, uh, maybe I would start with Yvonne, as you are involved in the light cap, and also maybe a question if um, it should be mandatory in the training uh, of architects or urban planners. I mean, they have a lot of things that they already have to uh, learn and think about, and um, daylight would be then an additional thing. Um, but how how could we integrate it in the um, education or the, the the system, the training system, and then also to uh, Johannes as he comes from this uh, field, so maybe yeah, he probably has a, a far more knowledge on this than I because uh, I'm not in architecture, of course, but uh, indeed education is 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 key, and uh, one would like to to make this obligatory in all. Uh, uh, um, course programs but of course there is a loss and particularly those cases where as Johannes also indicated sometimes there's a conflict between the thermal uh, aspects in a building and, and optimizing those and, and the light aspects um, education is key and I think it's not only it, it shouldn't be isolated just for architecture uh, departments I think if there's more awareness in the general public this will also automatically there will be a more strong call for for good daylighting in buildings and this will then also help raise the importance for for design and uh, so, so i think we should go both ways both in educating the general public um and uh, and, and trying to push this into architecture programs. i know there are a, a few very good ones that actually do this but uh, um uh, with so with with the, the knowledge that we're gaining uh, and we're, we're talking a lot about integrative lighting this um, it does involve a, a lot of technology, a lot of psychology, a lot of biology. So it's not easy, but uh, um, education is key here. But I'm sure Johannes has uh, has a more clear view on what's happening in architecture programs. Um, I would say that architects have a very good implicit knowledge about daylight because, you know, they are coming from a design perspective and they are thinking about views and, um, and and directionality, they are not that good in the explicit knowledge about daylight. So the quantitative um, analysis of daylight, and that comes back to bite them once the, the engineers for the thermal design, they are coming with the hard numbers. And then it's shrinking, uh, shrinking back uh, what you implicitly thought was, was quite well. And so I, I obviously education is key here so that that at least there is the knowledge ingrained in, in, in every architect, even if he doesn't analyze it himself, that he, that he knows that he there are possibilities, that there are ways to analyze it and hold something against um, other, other um, aspects of, of building physics uh, than, uh, than the daylight part. And I think that's really key here because it, I, it would be wrong to say that architects are, are bad in this. They are, they are not, but they are part of a, of a huge uh, design system where they, they are coordinating so many different partners and so many different needs. And um, if there are those who are sensitive to that, and they will include the partners um, who who can who can um, analyze that, and then uh, it gets to a more balanced design. I think, um, yeah. But I think it's not mandatory uh, right now in in architecture to learn anything about quantitative daylight design. Um, so there is some work ahead of us, I guess. 
Yeah, but um, on on the positive side, I mean the the um, Daylight Academy. Um, they are doing so much stuff. To, uh, there are uh, things like twenty four things about daylight, um, which are raising awareness. And I, I think once those things get rolling, it will get better and better in education. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Steve, and he's asking, "What is the?" And I saw that Johannes, you started to answer, so maybe in uh, real time, uh, what is the important wavelength range for simulating daylight with electric lights? Uh, is it 380 to 780 uh, nanometers, a narrower range, or all wavelengths that get to the atmosphere? Um, well, that really depends on what you're looking at. I mean, 380 to 780 nanometers, that's just the part of the spectrum which is visible to us. us. And obviously, if you are interested in the visual aspects or the melanopic aspects, because they work in the visual range as well, then this is the most important part. Going to UV, you really don't have to concern yourself on the inside because every glazing uh, is filtering that one out. Um, and then on the other side, you have the infrared part, which is very important for restorative um, effects. But um, I mean, this is the part that gets mostly cut out by the thermal engineer guys because it's the part that heats up the building. So for, for what I've talked about today, it's seven, uh, 380 to 780, basically. Can I add to this? Yes. Because uh, there are indications that indeed it's, it's important. To, so it's, it's wonderful that already that you're talking about 380 to 780 and not just the part of the IPRTC <laughs> uh, sensor, of course, because we want good light and pleasant light also. But there is actually a, a, a very important role for, for instance, UV light the, uh, for the vitamin D production. And uh, you can say, so we should be getting this outdoors perhaps, but if we go outdoors, we're typically uh, clothed. And uh, so we get very little of this of this daylight uh, of, of the UV factor. and. Indeed, our glazing and also our electric light are now um, uh, designed such that it that they do not give us UV light uh, for thermal reasons. For I don't know what, uh, it's there are also also unhealthy aspects to UV light. But um, actually, a small dosage of UV light is very important for us for our health, uh, and uh, uh, so we should be perhaps also designing for this. And there are a few first studies on this. You can of course. Um, uh, instead, uh, um, take some medications for this, um, but but actually daylight is is best uh, for for uh, vitamin D production. And um, uh, similarly, some interesting studies in uh, um, infrared are being carried out. But for instance, by uh, uh, Marijke in in uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands, and she is. Uh, there are some first indications that this infrared may also serve very important biological uh, um, services. So we don't know. I think it's a little bit early days to change the regulations, but we should be aware that there's more than just the visible light uh, that is important for our health. Yeah. Maybe to add to this question, um, as you mentioned, we have um, different design or performance criteria, the visual ones and the non-image forming ones. And of, of course, we cannot um, forget the energy efficiency of our design. And um, sometimes they are in conflict with each other. How do we deal with that? Maybe it's a question that um, all of you could address uh, shortly. Um, and then we will move back to the questions from the audience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not an easy one. Yeah, it's, it's um, really not an easy one. I think we just have to make sure. Well, I, I'm a scientist, so I say uh, I believe in science. Let's find ways to better ways to, to to meet all needs and not just thermal needs, just not just the visual needs, not just the biological needs. But try to to match and and energy and uh, sustainability are of course um, key. But uh, particularly if we're talking about daylight. Um, when you let daylight in, you need less electric light, right? So, so, uh, and then uh, I believe in science to solve the issues and the conflicts between thermal and uh, and daylight uh, adapts. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I believe so too. Um, I mean, um, the electric lighting of of a building can really have a, a big impact on the the cost of a building in use. But if you look at the life cycle of a building, I think 80% of the cost are the people that are in there. And the most energy efficient building you could uh, build is one where nobody is and you put just the lights off. So it, it's function first, and then on top of that, make it as energy efficient as possible, I would say, um, because we do need more light um, if we want to include those non-visual effects uh, in our artificial lighting. But if you have a good daylight design, you can save save much more, just as you once said. Yeah, it just has to be uh, not only designed well, but also implemented well, which is a common problem that that I am seeing in practice. Mm. Yeah, I agree with um, Johan what Johanna said, and the one um, that um, energy efficient. It should be, but um, the um, purpose of a building is first uh, to give the people that are working there or uh, living there uh, a healthy environment and um, and um, building what's uh, not healthy for the occupant is, uh, can't be energy efficient in that sense. So, mm. yeah. yeah. So um, this is a question that I think um, Yvonne uh, could answer uh, first. That um, it's about um, let's say the yeah that with respect to comfortable comfortable uh, light uh, we often um, indicate that contrast should be not too high. But in nature we uh, often have large contrast with shading, moving leaves, in, uh, inducing some uh, flicker, etc. cetera. Um, so why are we not bothered by those um, except in, um, so in, in nature? And what is the difference between the contrast in natural light outdoors and indoors? So I think it's a question that is asked a lot. Uh, why do we, um, yeah, accept more of the real thing yeah. than we do with the electric light. Yeah, it's very true. There have been some very interesting studies also focusing on glare, for instance, and that we uh, we accept a lot more glare from, from outdoor, from sunlight, than we do from electric light. So I think this is part, th this part is, is, is very much tied to that subjective experience and that appreciation that we have uh, basically, there's a balancing game going on in our appreciation for daylight and sunlight, and uh, and 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 accepting a little more glare um, in in favor of, of of still having that. And there's a lot of frustration often with um, uh, blinds going down automatically when the index says that there's a too much glare or too much con uh, the wrong contrast. Um, so so there's a part of this is subjective. At the same time, the, the contrast we see in nature, I, I, they're beautiful. They are actually the, the some of the wonder and the magic of, of, of the, the, the light uh, outdoors. But it may also be related to tasks. So for instance, when I'm in my garden, I'm enjoying the sun and the contrast uh, that, that the, sh the shade and the sun are giving. But as soon as I try to read a paper or a book in, that, uh, in, in those conditions, I, I get frustrated. So it may also be in related to tasks that we're doing uh, in the different contexts. So it's not always easy to, so, uh, um, and as soon as we, for instance, try to raise light levels indoors, even to a thousand bucks, which is nothing if you're outdoors, people are starting to squint. And so we have to be really sensitive also to our expectations, our appreciation, and the fact that we cannot one-to-one um, -one transpose what we have, transplant what we have outdoors to indoors. That may not always work. Um, also with when we're trying to simulate daylight. So I don't think we have to go to those contrast levels necessarily, but there are a lot of different mechanisms going on in this appreciation. But it's definitely an established fact that we are less, far less uh, sensitive, or should I say far less bothered by sharp contrasts and glare from daylight, just to illustrate that appreciation that we have for it, I think. Thank you. Um, 
Yes. Uh, would you like to add something, Johannes or Kai, or should we move to the next question, maybe? Because uh, we have only 12 minutes left. <laughs> so maybe just there's then a step. Yes. Very, very briefly uh, say that I can't say why it is, but um, Jan Wienold has done a lot of work in that context uh, with the daylight glare probability. Um, and the fact that you see that there is a need for a different mathematical um, formulation for daylight glare than for the other kind of glare really is a testament to how different we seem to perceive it, even though it's for the same office task uh, that we are that we are designing for. But yeah, I, I have nothing to add on why it could be because Yvonne already uh, elaborated on that. Um, then the next question would be on the variability of daylight that we see in intensity and contrast and spectra. Uh, we have diffuse and um, directional lighting, um, which then creates different uh, lighting atmospheres. And um, the question is, wouldn't mimicking daylight involve a different um, thought of indoor luminous systems and control as a translation of these atmospheric um, qualities into architectural lighting luminous. Um, right. And then um, Veronica says, thank you for elaborating on that, um, respecting, in example, existing studies like double uh, focus lighting. So it's maybe a question that could be tackled by um, Johannes. Um, first. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it certainly would. Um, would be a different approach than what you get um, from standard li lighting design, but um, there are, I think, different levels because if, if you get a very basic lighting design, it's always very focused on just reaching thresholds on surfaces uh, for your task. And this is, in, in all cases, it's far removed from what you uh, would design for uh, in, in a pleasant atmosphere because then you have to think about luminances and how they are distributed and I think then you you always come back to the natural order of things because that's what what we expect and seems to give us some kind of comfort so I I would say it's always um, a topic it's only often it isn't addressed yeah mm. As, but but I, I very much agree with this question that it's it's uh, when, when we think of mimicking daylight, if we really want to do it well, we have to take into account so many issues, not just the illuminance levels, but the spectral differences, the spatial differences, temporal differences, mm. perhaps even in, indeed the control. So um, uh, it, it is quite a puzzle. It's definitely not uh, uh, raising just illuminance levels in our uh, mm -hmm. ceiling. Uh, <laughs> ceiling mounted uh, luminaires that's not going to be uh, the solution so yeah. yeah um so regarding energy regulations we focus on efficacy which which has a photometric bias what do you think about using efficiency ratio of op optical watts to electrical watts over the wavelength range of interest so maybe a question that could be answered by Kai. I don't know if this is in your. <laughs> I think, especially in Germany, we see this um, also that the energy or engineering uh, decision makers have uh, much more power, not only in uh, design but also in funding. <laughs> um, so, how do we how do we overrule this, and how do we move more to a human set? that focus maybe this is more easy to answer or i don't know if it is <laughs> um yeah what, what to say um i hmm, i guess um yeah can, can you repeat <laughs> the point um <laughs> Yeah, it was. I... If if I may jump in, um, I've seen some 
suggestions for um, energy efficiency in terms of non-visual design, but uh, they all have one problem, and that is that depending on the time of day, um, you really have a different understanding of um, energy efficiency. So in, in during the day, you might want to emphasize on the blue part of the spectrum, but that's exactly what you don't want for evening light. So um, it, energy efficiency is always what you want to have, depending on how much you have to spend for it. And what you want to have it depends on the time of day. And I, I, I think about it, but I, I'm not sure how this can be implemented in, a, in an efficacy value. Yeah. yeah, another problem that we are facing is that um, there is a lot of unknown still, um, especially when we address the non-image forming um, effects. And the question is how can we deal with this known unknown uh, in the design process uh, or, or also in the st standardization? No? Like how can we overcome that or what to do with it? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, you, Johannes, could elaborate on that. Um, how do we deal with the unknown in the design? Well, I, I mean, design always needs to deal with that by just stating something, because in the end, you, you have to make a decision. And uh, it's it has to be a decision to the best of your knowledge and to to uh, that addresses or balances all the needs that you're aware of. And um, I mean, I think the best you can do with those unknowns is to at least document well, because as I, I've shown the example of the carpentry workshop that was done 10 years ago, we, we didn't have uh, melanopic EDIs, so the non-visual stimulus calculation uh, back then, but at least we documented uh, all the light spectra, and so we can recalculate what is happening there when the standards change. And then you can evaluate your design again and say, is it still okay, or do we need to change something? And I think that's key with dealing with the unknowns to at least document very well. Then we have a question by Bogdan. If you can be exposed too much to light inside or outside to badly affect melanopic effects? Um, I think this is a question, yeah, that can be answered. Uh, uh, yes, you, 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 can be, you, you can be uh, uh, exposed to too much uh, too much light, particularly if it's at the wrong time. So, so really what we're, when we're telling the story about light and circadian light, circadian effects, then we really should be talking about darkness as much as about light. So as Johannes just also uh, uh, stated, um, good light is about sufficient light during the day and sufficient darkness during the evening. So during the day, I don't think we will easily go above what we would get outdoors uh, with any lighting uh, solution. Um, uh, so I don't think the risk there is to, to have too much melanopic light, except when you're using it at the wrong time. And of course, with that's quite a large population that's not working nine to five jobs. So it, it may be complicated in, in public buildings and in, in larger buildings. But in general, I don't think with melanopic, in terms of melanopic activation, we can go too high indoors or we'll easily go too high. That's different, of course, for UV light. Yeah. Um, so maybe one more question for the um, facade. Um, I think it's uh, for Johannes. Uh, could you please share your views uh, of how facades with different colored glazing or with PV panels affect daylight optimization for melanopic daylight autonomy? So I guess this uh, question says we are not dealing with the size of windows, but just what uh, glazing is used in, in the window. Um, most of the time, you don't really care because most glazings in, in our everyday lives is melanopically speaking very equally on the visual and the melanopic side. So uh, transparency is not very uh, different. And that changes once you get to those examples I showed you with the high rise, um, because then 
the non or the parts of the spectrum that we are not that sensitive to, like the, the green, yellow, orangey part of the spectrum, they are trying to uh, keep that maximally high, but then cut off to the left and to the right. And that's obviously um, bad, but not only melanopically, uh, it's it's just bad in terms of color rendering. And if you see those kind of glass inside, and especially then there is a window open and you can see the sky and how it really looks, well, that's a bad situation. And uh, But that's more on the, uh, the psychological front, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe one final question uh, to all um, the participants in the panel. Um, can we uh, simulate daylight and is daylight as effective or, or simulated daylight as effective uh, uh, as um, the real, real daylight, um, especially for these uh, physiological effects um, that Yvonne mentioned in her um, um, uh, lecture, but also for the non-image forming effects. Um, Maybe we could start with yeah with Yvonne and then uh, or, or first with Kai because yeah I think it was very much focused on the presentations from Yvonne and and Johannes. Yeah, it's all right, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, oh yeah, it, it's a big question uh, if we can um, yeah artificially create a daylight um, and. I guess, or I know it's uh, still under investigation. <laughs> um, I would say, um, yeah, it could be possible, but, um, or it maybe will be possible some power, but um, first we have to know what makes daylight to daylight. And um, this is a question um, which I know is, um, under investigation um, at many places, but also at the TU in Berlin. And um, um, yeah, if, if we want to create daylight like it's there, um, it should be possible, I guess, but um, maybe it's more important to recreate these parts of daylight which we want to have. But first, we have to know what we want. <laughs> so it's a question of science for the next decades. Yeah. With that, maybe to Yvonne. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I very much agree with Kai. It would be wonderful if we could recreate it. But I think and from an energetic perspective, that would not be very interesting. We have yeah. brilliant daylight outdoors. So. Uh, but indeed, if we know which aspects of daylight are important, is it the spatial play? Is it the temporal play? Is it the specific part of the spectrum? Is it, uh, as soon as we, so the better we understand this, the better we can take the essence of what is daylight mm. to places where real daylight cannot enter. But uh, actually, let's first start with what we have out there. And then, so I, I'd love to have a tool like that for my lab and turn off and, and, and on certain uh, parts, um, but, uh, uh, but we have to also be, uh, be wise here and, and realize that there are multiple goals that we're trying to, to serve here. So I don't think exactly mimicking is, will, will be key to, to healthy buildings. I think there are more important parts there. Yeah. So we have one minute left, uh, Johannes. <laughs> okay, I, I'll try to be quick. Um, I very much agree with uh, Yvonne and Kai, um, but I'm cautious in the sense that um, once we open the door and say, oh yeah, we can do artificial lighting like it's daylight, then maybe daylight design will get even worse <laughs> because mm -hmm. you know, people will just say, okay, we can supplement it, no, no worries. <laughs> And and really, if you if you see good daylight design, oh, it's it's just so good, and I can't imagine that you can mimic it in in all um, in in all details in the foreseeable future, at least. And um, really, I, I mean, I've seen examples of of artificial daylight on a visual sense that is so good. I I know it's fake, but I I can't bring my brain to acknowledge it. Um, 
but there are the other aspects and the unknowns that you mentioned, and we, we really shouldn't ignore them just by saying that we don't know about them, so we can just substitute the daylight uh, artificial lighting one to one. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Johannes, and thank you, Kai, for participating today and um, for giving um, the talks and also discussing uh, daylight uh, on the International Day of Light. Uh, also, uh, thank you to the host for facilit facilitating this and uh, for the daylight talks um, to, yeah, to have us here and to um, have this conversation ongoing uh, on daylight. Thank you very much to everyone also participating online. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank thanks. you very much. Yeah, thanks, Aisha, for the great moderation. Thank yeah. you. <laughs>